Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Geopolitical Cyber Podcast, where I am joined by Tristan D'Souza, editor, editor and head of communications for Cyjax, and myself, CISO for Cyjax. Hi, Tristan. Hey, Ian. Happy New Year. Oh, it's a bit late for that, isn't it? But uh, yeah, how are you doing there? I'm doing all right. I'm really excited about bringing this uh, video podcast to the readers of Security Magazine. It's yeah. so wonderful to be uh, back in action on that. And, you know, without further ado, I think one of the big news stories that I know we were anxious to talk to people about is the proposed uh, $10 billion injection by the Biden administration into yeah. American cyber. Is it going to make a difference? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, it is exciting to uh, to be sharing this with uh, even more uh, potential listeners now, isn't it? And I mean, I think maybe even more across the pond. Um, so for whom this subject might actually be sort of, you know, really way more uh, integral than it might be for us. You might say, um, you know, $10 billion sounds a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got to look at some statistics, though, right? Uh, you know, it's worth noting that uh, worldwide, uh, the cybersecurity industry is worth over $100 billion. Yeah, um, I think about $152 billion, as I recall from some right. recent research. Yeah. So yeah, it's forecast to, uh, to, 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 to just continue growing. It has grown year on year. Um, I think comparisons with countries are also worthwhile in this sphere, right? I was just looking at the UK spend in 2016, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond, um, proposed uh, or rather uh, 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 stated that the government would spend £1.6 billion in five years. Uh, so that was tw 2016. And I now have it on good authority um, that over the next four years, we'll be spending about four to five billion pounds. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's significantly less than the 10 billion. Um, yes. which Biden has 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 put forward. Um, I think that that equates to around like, you know, seven billion pounds. Um, and I, I suppose what it comes down to, Ian, is uh, given that we can expect the US to take its role back uh, in some shape or form as the global policeman. Um, do we especially expect when it comes to cyber? Yeah, especially when it comes to cyber. Do we expect them to spend uh, in global proportion? Or do we expect them to spend just for their sort of I don't want to say America first, but, you know, he's going to have to put his country first, first to a yeah, certain and, extent. And rightly so. And I don't necessarily see that as a problem. I just feel that we need to look at a different business model because cybercrime is a global problem. It is yeah. not an exclusive problem into, uh, that only the United States is victimized by. Um the McAfee report that I saw about three weeks ago indicated that the losses due to cybercrime is one trillion dollars. Right. So, yeah. you know, 156 billion to 166 billion. Is it really even going to make any difference? Yeah. So so my feeling is that what we need to do here is look at um, agreements like that we have for things like NATO and for um, things like uh, the WHO, where everyone has to contribute um, a certain proportionality of their gross domestic product um, mm -hmm. on, you know, the defense. And now the defense, the, the thing that is impacting us the most is this trillion dollar cybercrime problem that we have. And when I think about that perspective, I mean, America has been very generous in providing both the um, enforcement and the uh, uh, evidentiary requirement at a level of transparency that isn't present in the other uh, Five Eye countries in terms of right. their actions against cyber criminals. Mm. I mean, it, it, just you know, speaking broadly, I was very surprised that a cyber criminal who had amassed $27.5 million living in the comfort of uh, Gatineau, Quebec. Uh, there was no comment from the RCMP on this, the Royal Canadian mm -hmm. Mounted Police. There were, you know, basically it was like America is arresting this guy for ripping off a whole bunch of people, which are, in terms of victims are not just exclusively Americans and they are not just exclusively Canadians. And, and so I think... 
we are in a very ugly situation where it seems like we are struggling at a national level to govern mm. something that is far beyond the national borders and scope. It's it's the polar opposite to giant tech. You know, mm. everyone's arguing, you know, how do we make Google and Facebook and how do we manage them as these global companies that have gross national product, you know, that exceeds um, many countries in yeah, the entire yeah. world? How do we bring them to heel? Well, the same question can be asked. I, I feel like we're not investing enough and we're outsourcing this responsibility to the U.S., yeah, I mean, I agree. But I suppose two problems I see with that are, uh, one, uh, we know that multilateral uh, uh, engagement uh, on the lo along the lines of like the UN or, uh, you know, uh, or since you mentioned it, the WHO, you know, uh, is fraught with political uh not danger so much, but intrigue, you know, they countries find it very hard to get along. So uh, if they've already found it very hard to get along in those institutions, why would they uh, uh, come together to allow themselves to be governed by yet another uh, multinational or supranational body? Uh, so that's my one question. Uh, the second one is, if the US government can't even protect itself, see solar winds, um, how how can we really expect it to ex to, 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 to uh, comprehensively protect its citizens and uh, businesses. I mean, you know, that, that, that supply chain attack was massive, was debilitating, and was, I think, also embarrassing uh, mm -hmm. to a certain degree, you know. Um, and I think, you know, for the US government, um, they need to take a long, hard look in-house first, perhaps, at some of the structures there, which, you know, needn't necessarily take ages. It, you know, I, I think I think all it needs is the will. And actually, to, to sort of almost reverse my point, the will seems to be there. The, the, you know, uh, uh, Biden has shown with this, um, uh, this $10 billion that he is willing, at least, to engage very, very head on with this problem. And that is something that, uh, you know, should reassure us, I suppose, um, at least in the short term. Well, certainly one of the nations that seems to be willing to step up is the Ukrainians when they door smashed uh, one of the largest ransomware uh, cartels um, infrastructure only to discover that it was running on the hand-me-down computers that have been life cycle management out um, uh, and and that I was surprised. I, I was shocked that this multi-million dollar cybercrime cartel uh, was running their entire business on computers that we life cycled out of production a very long time ago. But mm. I just guess it shows that there's such a disparity between the billions or hundreds of millions being spent on, you know, the cyber defense industry versus what the cost of entry for cybercrime uh, is I think I think this is a topic that we're going to put um, a, a marker in and certainly come and revisit it. And then on the other, shall we, shall we say, diametrically opposed uh, country, we yeah. see uh, President Putin bringing a smackdown to any sort of opposition and pulling out tactics that can only be described as um, communist uh, at the height of the Iron Curtain. Yeah, I mean, talking of uh, barriers to entry, uh, if you're a cyber criminal in Russia, uh, as we know, there, there don't seem to be very many. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, at the moment, you know, uh, so, so I, well, we've already brought it in. SolarWinds demonstrates that there are significant strides being made by Russian operatives. You know, yes. we know that they're one of the most fearsome uh, adversaries globally uh, in 2021. Uh, they made, they've, they've, they've made uh, really destructive attacks against numerous outfits in numerous major countries uh, over the last several years. Um, there, there, there are serious threats to US government and other governments around the world. Um, but, you know, um, Putin has always shown himself willing to uh, put his interests first. You know, I, I mean, there was, there was a great quote 
uh, when asked whether he was worried about having waited until 15th of December to congratulate Joe Biden on winning the presidency, he said, you can't spoil a spoiled relationship. So, you know, I mean, that guy couldn't give two hoots, it seems to me, about his uh, relationship with the Americans. And that's shown, as you were saying, by the fact that he's, uh, you know, locking up most of the uh, opposition to him. They're making mass arrests. Um, you know, you wouldn't say there was anything approaching a free press. Um, th th there are pockets of resistance. Um, but I think, how do you solve a problem like that uh, without um, potentially pushing a kinetic response? It, it, there's there's two dynamics there. There's um, what happens if the West takes a really hard line against Russia um, the Russian government and their significant cyber threat capabilities will get unleashed on us, and we have far more to lose than they do, being a primarily digital economy uh, versus an economy that, shall we say, is not nearly as susceptible to uh, cyber interruption and cyber intrusion uh, than, than our own. So you're right in that there is um, a whole bunch of opportunities and actions Russia can take in retaliation. Um, and we would be in a very precarious legal position, um, as some people have called, for unleashing the military on, which is essentially a civilian law enforcement problem against these Russian uh, criminals. Um, and that was called for in a, in a very ill-conceived Financial Times article um, that the idea being is that, well, we should, we should take uh, American military might and turn it on uh, cyber criminals. This is a terrible idea um, because uh, America has already proven that it's very capable of doing cyber um, investigations. What I think needs to occur here is exportation of their capability to other nations and following the rule of law. The, mm. the potential for escalation because the U.S. military is, is, is now conducting cyber attacks against uh, Russian operatives, those patriotic citizens deserve a defense. And all of a sudden, we are at some sort of um, uh, escalation. And I think that's a that's a calculus that we're going to have to be very careful about. I mean, the likelihood of us falling into a, a you know a head-on war with with Russia is well us. I, I mean, I, I I despise the fact that I just referred to the West as us. I, I don't I don't mean that. Like, but you know, like the U.S. coming at loggerheads to such an extent that militaries are deployed on the ground and they clash. The likelihood of that, I'm sure you agree, is 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 low. Like, you know, at this point, I don't think it would benefit either country. As you say, Putin has less to lose, for sure. But I mean, we have to take into account the increased, again, it comes back to multilateral organizations. Biden has, has signaled that he is, you know, by, by re-entering the Paris Climate Accords, for example. That is not just a, a small thing. That is indicative of his over, overall uh, way of doing politics. He's going to be multilateral. But equally, you know, on the other side of things, we have China, um, you know, which is another headache for Biden. But, you know, they recently signed uh, the uh, comprehensive agreement on investment with the EU, which is essentially to China, in many ways, a buffer between them and US economic aggression, because uh, their sort of calculus being, well, I guess the EU won't be able to step in on U the US's side against us when, for example, we're calling for sanctions for the, the, the atrocities going on in Chanjing, for example, because, you know, Germany wants Deutsche Telekom to be the first foreign company to get telecoms access. So, you know, um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, it, it, it's something, uh, you know, it's, it, it's worth noting that uh, Putin has his own problems at home, uh, but, yep. uh, you know, I imagine he's going to be helped by the global, uh, by, by, by the, by the, by the terrible global situation that Biden inherits. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think this brings us to another topic that we wanted to talk about where we've seen a pivot in cybercrime attacks from what originally was sort of a support mechanism to brave the worst of the lockdowns and the COVID into a full-on cyber um, crime opportunity space 
regarding vaccines. Yeah. And, and we've seen at, 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 we've seen a marked increase in the amount of scams, some very sophisticated and some not so sophisticated by non-traditional actors. And what, what do I mean by that? Um, it appears that these scams are in a lot of cases domestically um, or um, being perpetrated by organizations that we haven't really um, associated with, um, I would say, nation state level cyber criminals. Examples being uh, Silver Terrier in uh, Nigeria, some Jamaican um, cyber crime outfits targeting um, the, the folks that are applying for benefits, um, but also um, the phishing attacks seem to be a, an attack on the hope uh, to get a hold of a vaccination. Yeah, I mean, they're shocking statistics, really. And, and you know, I do sometimes find myself falling into the trap of um, uh, some admiration, as it were, of, you know, the, the skills of some of these cyber criminals. And I think that's fine when you're looking at, uh, you know, a, a, a hack against uh, the Pentagon or something which doesn't result in any loss of life or doesn't really uh, affect anyone directly on the ground. But, you know, there was a 58 percent increase in data breaches in the healthcare sector in 2020. A hundred million dollars or more was lost by Americans alone to COVID-19 and stimulus check scams. Yeah. And this is, you know, like... I have a steady job and I can sit at home in a warm home and pay my bills. And I've found 2020 difficult. If I got scammed out of my support check, I do not know what I would have done. And yeah. the depravity, and I, I don't often get, you know, too emotionally attached to this sort of stuff or affected by, because it's not, it, there's a lot of impersonal stuff that we deal with in this sector. But this is not impersonal. This is just the most base criminality that is taking advantage, as you quite rightly say, of the hope that people have in trying to get their lives back on track. And, you know, at the best of times, a phishing email, if you look carefully, is not that clever. So you're probably going to pick out a spelling mistake or, you know, like a lowercase letter where it shouldn't be or something. But if you are in line for a COVID-19 vaccine and you get an email through saying your appointment has been made, I can't imagine you're going to, uh, you know, look too deeply beyond the surface. You're going to click, yeah. you're going to input your details. And, you know, most of the time it's super sensitive information that you're inputting as well. So if you haven't lost your stimulus check money, you're going to lose your, you're going to be identity uh, scammed. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you're quite right. They're, they're exploiting the current state of global unrest to a really quite disgusting degree. I, I find this one like quite a quite a horrible subject to be to be covering, really. Yeah. And I mean, in speaking of horrible subjects, I mean, we saw um, a, a large um, a population gather for the annual celebration of American uh, football, uh, the, the Super Bowl. Um, you know, I think my view of it, certainly from the pictures that I've seen, is this could be the super spreader event that kicks the United States uh, over half a million dead. Um, I'm not sure, though, um, that the institutions in the United States have been nearly as aggressive when it comes to um, enforcement of, of the edicts. We've suffered from that, too, here in the UK, um, with uh, sort of a wishy-washy approach to um, what should have been another hard lockdown. It turns out that not everyone is following the rules. Um, mm. What are your thoughts? Like, are we are we too selfish as as um, a population, and are we deserving what we're getting? No, I reject that uh, line of inquiry out of hand. I mean, I really do. I I, I just think the idea of blaming. Uh, the increased spread of a pandemic, which means global epidemic, and therefore can probably only be controlled by concerted global governmental yes. action. The idea of blaming that on a few teenagers that go to a party, or even 60,000 people that go to the Super Bowl, is wrong. Governments are to blame, 
they had they particularly the US and UK governments for the loss of life in their countries and that is where I think the buck stops yeah I, I agree 100%. I think, though, that what's interesting to me is that all part of that disinformation campaign, the attack on hope for a vaccine, all of those things, I think, lead us to the reality that we're being manipulated um, and we're being sent messages that are inherently destructive to our way of life. And who those actors are, are either, like you said, the, the truly, um, uh, the sort of the truly evil, the truly terrible, um, but also we, I think as a result, have made ourselves very susceptible um, yeah. to this yeah. uh, because of our desire for the information. Yeah, it was a perfect storm, right? Yeah. I mean, if you could design two governments that you wouldn't want in control at the beginning of a pandemic, it would probably be the Trump administration and the one controlled by Boris Johnson. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting situation in which we find ourselves. But, you know, it's difficult enough for people to get through, you know, the fishing pandemic, as it were, you know, on top of the pandemic pandemic without their own government sending their children laptops infected with malware, you know, as the UK administration did. Yeah. It's yeah. just like, guys, come on, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to do something right. And you know, as we as we've shown, we did vaccine procurement right because we, uh, you know, put our eggs in multiple baskets, and that was very clever. Well done, the one member of the uh, UK administration who had her head screwed on right. Um, but you know, uh, you've got to help people out, man. You can't distribute eight hundred thousand laptops all of which are infected with gamma roo and expect people to get through you know i mean it's uh yeah um i i i do think that the messaging has improved uh over the course of the pandemic but we're you know we're almost 12 months in and i think you know certainly certainly i i don't know whether you agree with this but you know um there's 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 so much messaging about the physical sides of it. Wouldn't it have been interesting to see some messaging about, uh, you know, the cyber sides of it? You know, we, we see uh, during election time, the the major platforms flagging Trump tweets as, as, as uh, you know, questionable or COVID tweets um, as like, do you want to read the story? Do you, uh, you know, uh, this has information about COVID, which may be debatable. You know, I think that's an admirable step in the right direction. But wouldn't it have been interesting or wouldn't it still be interesting to see governments putting forward information that, you know, circulating on BBC News at 6 p.m., there are COVID-19 scams going out uh, talking about NHS vaccine stuff. Yeah. You know, like it would be so great to see that. And I don't know why the apparatus of the state can't be uh, um, wound up to, to mobilize. To, to, you know, mobilize. That's what I mean. But yeah, yeah. So um, one of the major stories that has a huge cyber community element was um, the Occupy Wall Street 2.0 digital <laughs> edition, the stonks market, yeah. and GameStop, and activism, and billionaires crying that people don't know how to play the game that they've been playing, but now people are playing the game. But I, in fact, I look back on this, and it's like everybody's losing. Mm. Some people are losing more than other people. Companies are losing. The SEC doesn't know what to do or what to no. make of this suddenly sudden uh, situation. But w what do you see? Is this uh, an unraveling or is this a hacking the system? W what do you think? It's really interesting. I uh, I don't profess to be a particular expert on financial markets, but I found this story so interesting because of the messaging, right? Uh, on 6th January, we saw a group of um, internet organized angry people storm a major institution. Right. La later on that month, we saw an angry group of internet organized uh, people storm another major institution. It just so happens that one of them was wearing a big uh, horned hat and, uh, you know, was half naked and cops died um, in the storming of the US Capitol. But, you know, and then the other one, they were made out to be heroes. And it's yeah. it's it's interesting that messaging. I can't work out whether they did hack the system because they were playing within the system. Exactly. You yeah. know, I mean, they were using this Robin Hood trading app, which allows which gives people like you and me access to 
uh, you know, these big markets, which otherwise we might not have. OK, mm -hmm. great. But BlackRock made something like two billion off this. Yeah, you know, like they're not a small fish. They're one of the biggest fish in the big, big biggest of ponds. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know, it, I think it, there's something similar. I was reading a very interesting article the other day, which was talking about how this is a it is sort of similar to the platform populism that you see with like um, Airbnb and Uber, much of which is bankrolled by Saudi Arabia. And so, you know, it's already murky by the time you get there, but also it gives a veneer of democratization. You know, it's letting the little guy trade in the same way as Uber was letting us all get a chauffeur driven car um, and Airbnb lets you have a posh flat in the middle of Rome. But like at what cost? Airbnb yeah. has gutted the housing markets in most of the major cities in the uh, in Europe and driven uh, a, a speculative real estate buying spree. Yeah, exactly. 100%. Uber has put a ton of taxi drivers out of business and uh, frankly now has just jacked its prices up to what they were when you were looking for a black cab. So I imagine, you know, Robin Hood uh, had been in trouble before. You know, with the SEC, it had been investigated before for uh, um, for uh, 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 other other sort of funding errors uh, that it that it uh, you know didn't have enough cash um, to to pay out. Um, I I just don't buy the story that this is hero investors undermining Wall Street. I think at the end of the day, they're playing within very very closely within the rules of the system. It just so happened that one of the victims, many of the victims, were traders who we all somehow have been conditioned to hate. Um, but I, I I think as you said at the, at the introduction to this section, I just think most people are going to lose out of this. It just seems the same people are probably going to win, right? One uh, one guy who is obviously uh, making some moves and endearing himself to the community. Do we call him the man that some people love to hate? Elon Musk uh, just no. drops one point. What is it? One point five billion dollars in Bitcoin. Bitcoin, uh, you know, climbs at record rates. You know, are we seeing the ultimate hacker, Elon Musk, mobilizing a community to do his bidding? I mean, the man is crazy, right? But also, crypto let's, is... Let's like, nuke Mars. Yeah, I mean, calling, you know, when he had that pedo scandal, calling that diver who was trying to rescue the kids stuck in a cave, he called him a pedo. It's like, the guy is clearly unhinged. Uh, and, you know, he needs regulating. But also, to do, you know, he needs to regulate himself. At least the cryptocurrency markets could be regulated by governments. And I think that is something that needs to be looked at for sure you know it shouldn't be allowed that some really rich man can put hashtag bitcoin in his twitter handle uh, and the price rises that is mental yeah. and I, I don't know you know I, I they should cryptocurrency should be regulated robin hood is clearly not a winning of david versus goliath uh you know i think goliath still won in the end one of the questions though is and it comes back to when he um when he made uh, a tweet uh, that he got fined for. Um, and the tweet was essentially that he was going to take Tesla private. Right. And, and if you recall, he was fined $20 million for the, by the SEC, right? right? But I believe he made in excess of $20 million just by the stock market's reaction to said tweet of yeah. boosting the price of stock that he owns. Yeah. So, so the really que the real question is is that is the system that we have even going to be effective? Yeah. I, I feel like you know we invented a whole bunch of things in cyber that the legal system and the regulatory system is struggling to figure out. I think is this the dawn of uh, of uh, some creative um, uh, some creative work in terms of understanding the financial system and all of a sudden our regulations and, and uh, are, are incapable of dealing with this um, to, yeah. to an effective extent. The real question is, is everyone starts rolling out the idea of protection, protection from, you know, the finance, protection from the, um, the cyber criminals. You know, we, we hear this thing about all the need for protection. The question is, is this a protection racket? 
Mm-hmm. Are we are we inventing these perils just to fund the 156 odd billion dollars a year we put into cybersecurity because we haven't figured out how to actually deal with the cybercrime issue? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point. I think uh, there's a lot of money that gets spent on cybersecurity that is probably bad, good money after bad. That is for sure. And I'm not saying that the people selling it know that they're snake oil salesmen every single time. But I think there's more that governments could do to make people uh, more aware of, you know, the issues. Training is getting better and better all the time. But, uh, you know, last year we talked several times on this podcast about corporate responsibility. And I don't think it can just come down to government regulation or, you know, industry oversight. I think industry oversight works best when actually it's all of the companies within that sector working together to make their sector safer. And it doesn't go top down. Top down very rarely works. You know, it has to be a joint effort. And, you know, in any sector, it doesn't matter what sector it is, you need the biggest players to come together and to say, look, we're going to combat this. The human element is always the least safe part of a cybersecurity network, right? Like you're, you're the, you're, we're the weak points into any company's network and therefore training is key the right training is also key we know this that you know that that sticking someone in front of a video and asking them to you know answer a few questions doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to imbibe the answers so it's corporate culture that also needs to probably change but i think um I, i try and end on an optimistic note i don't know governments governments are catching up uh, at the end of the day, they, they, of course, they were going to be slow off the mark, keeping up with Silicon Valley and keeping up with the regulation of, uh, you know, the major tech firms, as you mentioned, they're not the only uh, ones that we have to be worried about. I think cybercrime is is, an, is another issue, but I think the major nations are, are, are going great guns. As you say, the US is pretty good at doing these investigations in many cases. Uh, let's just, I guess we've got 30 odd years more of Putin. So, that's a that's a puzzle we'll have to work out another time. But you know, I think I think there are there's the winds of change are are blowing in the right direction, I think, as far as I'm concerned. Well, on that insight, I think what we'll do is we'll end it here for our viewers of Security Magazine. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you've any comments or feedback, you can certainly put them below this video. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Ian. 